In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a great honour and privilege to be with you this morning and to celebrate the feast of St Philip and St James, or Pip and Jim, as they familiarly call them in the United Kingdom. Well, my husband John and I have played a game for years in which we imagine where we'd like to retire, by the sea, good cathedral privileges, a good pub, north or south. I have to say, having seen the uh, hill country yesterday, I could add that to the list. <laughs> the possibilities are dizzying. As that date approaches, however, the pastime becomes less appealing. There is something terrifying about the thought that we could live anywhere we like with no job or purpose to limit our choice. Well, Philip and James did not choose their final resting place or even their shared remembrance. Their bones ended up together in what is now the Apostoly Church in Rome. And so they're celebrated on the same day. Whether they have anything apart from their shared discipleship in common or not, Philip as we heard today, is a defined character in John's Gospel. Formerly a follower of the Baptist, probably Greek, active in the loaves and fishes miracle, and as in our Gospel, asking a key question, show us the Father. James the Less is more of a mystery. Is he the James mentioned as son of Blessed Mary's sister? Was he perhaps the brother or cousin of Jesus, James the Just, who led the Jerusalem church? So Jerome and others believed. So the disciples we honour today are randomly associated and one doesn't even have a secure identity. Yet by their witness, we were born. We owe so much to the apostles with all their limitations. A poem by Ursula Fanthorpe has Christ described them as my keystone cops of disciples, always running absurdly away or lying ineptly. Christ here alludes to their various martyrdoms as dying ridiculous and undignified, flayed and stoned and crucified upside down. And indeed, Philip is held to have been crucified upside down, like Peter, and to have kept on preaching from his cross, which we can believe, given his tendency to pipe up and ask questions in the gospel. James, if he was the just and bishop of Jerusalem, is traditionally martyred by being thrown off the top of the temple. Even in their deaths, they have to fit the story and add a touch of poetic justice. This arbitrariness in the deaths and Pip, uh, sorry, of Philip and James <laughs> can teach us something helpful. We tend to think of freedom ever since the Enlightenment as freedom from any kind of external control to allow us to do whatever we like. But that is not true freedom. From Aristotle onwards, we have learnt that true freedom lies in the fullest expression of all our gifts and capacities, what we call human flourishing. Adam and Eve, before the fall, are truly free in that they live a fully human life in which their will is upright and free to choose the good and delight in doing so. They eat always of the tree of life. Once they begin to consider eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as a real possibility, they have lost their freedom and are trapped in a mode of choosing that is actually captivity. And we can see this all around us 
in today's world of expressive individualism. It is a tyranny. Ironically, Milton's Eve in the poem Paradise Lost begins to view God as a tyrant and seeks freedom only to then say, lead on to the snake, exchanging the liberty of having an upright will that loves the good to obedience to a creature. In our Old Testament readings, psalmist and prophet unite to delight in the freedom of true obedience. Make me go in the path of your commandments, for that is my desire, says the psalmist. While Isaiah anticipates the guidance of Christ on the road to Emmaus, as he urges, and when you turn to the right, or when you turn to the left, your ears shall hear a word behind you, saying, this is the way, walk in it. Anyone who has written poetry will know that blessedness comes from form. However free the verse, the limitations set by either rhyme or meter shapes the thought and sets it flying. We err if we see ancient or indeed modern Jews as merely obeying a set of rules. They are more like poets. Law, shown here, means cleaving to a desire for God with all the serious delight of a child playing, I don't know if this is going to mean anything to you in America, grandmother's footsteps, Simon says. <laughs> it's no accident that the psalm about this love of God's law, 119, is the longest. Turn my eyes from watching what is worthless. Give me life in your ways. It's a matter of keeping alive, of cleaving longing to be close to God. Now we come close to God in the face of Christ. And thanks to Thomas's and Philip's questions, we know that to see Christ is to see the Father. Indeed, the implication of Christ's response to Philip is that those who follow Christ also share in this divine life and open its treasures to others. Followers of the way, as you know, was the earliest description of Christians, by which we see that to cleave to Christ is a mode of life a way of being in the world. Paul says in Corinthians that God's glory shines in us so that we too become part of the way to God as Philip and James did by their preaching and witness, which led them to martyrdom. For as Christ said to Peter, so it was for them. Someone would bind them and take them where they did not wish to go. Many of you are bound for ordained ministry, and you too will have little choice, but the diocese and college will decide where you are best placed. You will be like St. Paul, slaves for Christ in giving up choice. You have a divine forerunner in the Son who emptied himself and took on the form of a slave, taking on human flesh and ensoulment in his incarnation. And you have forerunners in the apostles who were scattered hither and thither, only united in the case of Philip and James in the tomb. What our scriptures today tell you, I believe, is that wherever you find yourself, and this is true for us all in priestly or lay vocations, that limitation of place and community is a blessing. There the Lord waits to be gracious to you. There is a place for us, somewhere a place for us, my husband and myself, and wherever it may be, God waits for us as he waits for you. The important thing is to embrace where we end up, to grow to love the streets, the people, even the problems, because they're your problems. It's what the universal but particularly Anglican vision of parish is based on the givenness of place, the responsibility for all the creatures, plants and people that it holds. No wonder it's a word cherished by environmentalists in my own country. The way to love God and his world is through the particular. 
the incarnate Christ and his pattern of self-giving to those he encounters. And it starts here at this table where we hold out our hands to receive all that Christ offers and the way we must go. All we need to know is that we travel the way that Philip and James trod before us and we travel freely, shaped by the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, to whom be the glory and honour now and always. Amen. Amen.